I'm Dr. Mike Murphy. I have a PhD in computer science, and I teach computer science and information systems at Coastal Carolina University. In this lecture, I'm going to provide an overview of computer hardware. I'm going to discuss the components that make up a computer system or a computational device more generally at a high level. These components include such features as the case, the power supply, the motherboard, the central processing unit or CPU, random access memory or RAM, persistent storage, and video and network adapters. So let's begin with the case. The computer case is the outwardly visible part of the computer system. The case can come in various different sizes, which we'll see in a moment, but the case really serves three purposes. First, it keeps all of the internal components together. It provides us a convenient way to, to carry and move all of the internal components, which are individual pieces, together without having to disconnect and reconnect the components every time we want to move the system. A second important function is you'll notice that most computer cases are made of metal or at least have metal coatings. And the reason for that is that the metal forms what's called electrical shielding. It shields those internal components from outside electrical interference, which can come from a wide variety of sources, including electrical appliances, lightning, even cosmic discharges in the upper atmosphere. So the ability of the case to shield the components from those types of electrical interferences uh, is highly important. Another highly important feature of the case is that the case directs airflow through the system and radiates heat. Again, because the case is made of metal in many cases, it can actually function as a heat sink. It can take the heat that's inside the case and by warming the case and exposing the case to the outside air, it can help to radiate that heat. Computer components, when they're operating, do produce a significant amount of heat in many cases, and this heat has to be removed, otherwise the components would fail. Now cases come in a variety of shapes and sizes. The general term that we use to describe the size and shape of a case is called its form factor and there are a number of different form factors out there. For traditional computer systems, we normally use some variant of the ATX form factor. This would be for desktop computers. Uh, micro ATX and then the smaller mini ITX are offshoots of the ATX form factor. There's also something called the ultra small form factor that Intel has been pushing lately. Uh, that's basically the compu a computer not that much larger than a deck of playing cards, or maybe a couple decks stacked. There's also a rack mount system for server usage and laptop style systems. Uh, these are simply different ways of packaging the same types of components into different size systems for different purposes. We can also consider, when we talk about computing devices generally, and not just considering, for example, traditional desktops or traditional laptops, we can consider mobile devices. Mobile devices come in a variety of form factors also. For example, here we have a cell phone. Here's a Nexus 7 tablet. Uh, there's different types and styles of mobile device out there and each different style and each different size can be considered to be a different form factor. So when we consider computational devices more broadly, we actually have a huge range of form factors. Everything from about the size of a wristwatch on up to uh, large scale server systems such as these pictured here uh, mounted inside racks. So we have quite a few different possibilities for how we package the computing device, but all the packages serve the same function. They keep the device together, they provide some type of shielding normally, and they uh, allow us to transport the device safely and, and keep the components protected. Okay, so what actually goes inside the case? All right, the case is just a shell. It's just an outer container that holds all the parts. 
inside the case we have a number of different components. And I'm going to start with the power supply because this component is extremely important to the operation of any computing system. Historically and generally, the power supply converts mains electric power, which would be AC voltage, such as the kind that you get from a wall outlet, into low voltage DC power. Now AC stands for alternating current. That means that the direction in which current flows shifts back and forth uh, 50 to 60 times per second, depending on where you're located in the world. And DC means direct current. It means that the current flows in one direction. All internal computer components operate on DC power. But our electrical power grid operates on AC power. Furthermore, internally, computer components operate mostly at 5 volts and occasionally at 12 volts DC. Our mains electric power in the United States and North America in general, so includes Canada and Mexico, operates at 120 volts and 60 hertz cycle. In other countries, European countries in particular, mains electric power is at 240 volts at 50 hertz cycle. So the type of voltage we have coming in varies depending on where we are in the world and it's up to the power supply component to convert that voltage into something the computer can use. Now this power supply can be located internally. This is an internal power supply that I'm showing in the picture here. It mounts inside the case and these wires coming out of it plug into various different components inside the computer. On the back, not shown here, is a, is a uh, location where we will plug in an extension, what amounts to an extension cord, uh, that plugs into the mains electric supply. So we actually plug a power cord into the outlet in the wall, that cord plugs into the back of this power supply, and then the power supply produces the appropriate DC voltage for the system. Now not all systems have this kind of power supply. A laptop, for example, will use an external power supply. It has a power brick, which is basically a large uh, AC adapter that plugs into the wall and then plugs into a port on the laptop computer. Similarly, mobile devices, such as a mobile phone or an MP3 player, will have an external charger, and that charger performs the same function. Most of these operate now at USB power levels, which is 5 volts. DC and these chargers convert mains electric power into 5 volts and that 5 volts is then fed into the device. Now devices may have an internal battery, uh, portable devices especially will tend to have internal batteries and these devices are charged by the external power supply and provide a certain amount of runtime away from mains power. So this allows you to take your laptop and actually use it in your lap without having to be plugged into the wall and in the case of a mobile phone or other portable device it can give you several hours to several days of runtime just off the internal battery. There are other ways of charging the battery incidentally uh, solar power for example uh, but that would function as just a different type of external power supply. So that's what gives us the electrical power that we need to run all the components the main circuit board that we plug all the components into inside a computer is called the motherboard, or Apple Computer calls this a logic board. It's the same principle. It's a, basically a large circuit board that all the other components connect to. And they can connect to either via slots, like we see here for the memory, or sockets, like we see here for the processor or connectors like we see here on the edge of the board. So different devices can plug in in different ways. And this main circuit board is responsible for connecting the devices together, allowing the devices to interoperate with each other, and linking together things like the memory and the CPU so that the computer can actually operate. So speaking of those components, let's start with the central processing unit of the CPU. The CPU is the chip that actually runs the computer. This is the integrated circuit that actually executes software instructions. This is the part that gets work done. <coughs> now, 
CPU may be attached to the motherboard in various different ways. Modern CPUs actually have contact points that connect to pins that are inside the motherboard socket and attach the CPU that way. Older CPUs, such as the one in this picture, uh, used metal pins on the CPU that would plug into very small holes in the CPU's socket. So the spot on the motherboard where you'd mount the CPU, you would actually put these pins into the holes. Uh, they had a tendency of bending pretty easily though, uh, which is part of the reason that manufacturers have gone to using the contact point method. Uh, this particular CPU that I've pictured here is a 486 CPU. Uh, this is extremely old, uh, late 1980s technology. This was just a really good picture I found on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, modern CPUs look similar except that they have contact points and they're different sizes and of course internally they're a whole lot faster than this particular uh, CPU was. Now it is possible on some devices, particularly embedded devices like mobile phones, uh, but also on some low-end computer systems to have the CPU permanently attached to the motherboard using solder. Uh, that is popular because it's a little bit cheaper, it saves a few cents over installing a socket, and it also takes slightly less space. So in the case of a mobile phone where you're trying to hit a very specific price point, very specific profit margin, and you're trying to save as much space as possible inside the device, it's quite useful to solder the CPU in physically. So that's the main component that actually makes the computer go, is the CPU but it can't do it alone. It needs some help from some other components. One extremely important component that helps the CPU execute instructions and process data is the random access memory, or RAM. And the purpose of RAM is to store data and software for a very short period of time, relatively speaking, that we're actually using that data or software. In other words, this is a place where we can hold information that we need to get to pretty quickly. This type of media storage, this type of data storage, is relatively fast. Compared to the CPU, it's much slower, but compared to the persistent storage devices like the hard disk, this type of storage is actually quite fast. This type of storage is volatile, though. That means that it requires power in order to remember whatever's being stored inside it. Whenever we remove power, let's say we turn off the computer, we unplug the computer, the contents of, of RAM are actually lost. And that's because the electrical circuit has to be maintained in order for RAM to remember the data that's stored inside it. That's part of what makes RAM fast, but it also makes RAM volatile, meaning that if we store data in RAM, it's going to be lost as soon as we turn off the computer. But we want to store it in RAM because it's relatively fast while we're working on it. So what we do inside a computer system is we actually create what's called a memory hierarchy, and we use RAM to store information while we're processing it. But for long-term storage, we use other types of devices, and we call these devices collectively persistent storage devices. These long-term storage devices are non-volatile. They keep their stored data even if we turn off the power or unplug the computer. There is a trade-off, however, to these types of devices, and that is that they are slow. Compared to RAM, they are significantly slower, and in fact, they would not be practical for working with data directly from the CPU, because the CPU is just so much faster than these devices. So what RAM does is it provides us with a buffer between these really slow devices and the really fast CPU, and that improves the efficiency of the system. Now persistent storage generally comes these days in two major forms that we're going to look at. There are a couple of other forms that are used in enterprise systems and in some special cases, but the two general forms are the hard disk drive, which is a mechanical device, and the solid state drive, which is an electrical device. I'm going to talk about the hard disk drive first. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this is a mechanical device. Uh, outwardly, it basically looks like a metal box with a connector or a couple connectors on it. It stores data magnetically, either on a metal 
platter or a metal coated glass platter. Now I took the cover off this drive. Uh, this is an old drive. Uh, do not take the cover off your hard drive. It will void your warranty. Uh, but this is an old drive that I'm not using anymore, so I didn't mind. And we can see the internal components of the drive here. This is a laptop drive, so these are actually going to be glass platters coated with a metallic substance. And these platters spin around at a really high rate of speed. And these things called drive heads actually move back and forth along the platter. And the drive heads magnetize or demagnetize very tiny spots on the platter. And that's actually how it stores data. But this thing is mechanical. Uh, this thing rotates around. These drive heads move back and forth. Compared to the CPU, that takes forever. It's an extremely slow process in computer speak, in computer times. And so it's not really that efficient in terms of speed. It is, however, efficient in terms of the amount of data that we can store on a single drive. Uh, four terabyte drives, for example, are now readily available. So we can store a lot of data on one of these devices. But they are mechanical, which means they're slow. They are mechanical, which means they're also going to break sooner or later. Everything mechanical eventually breaks down. Another type of drive that we can use for persistent storage is a non-mechanical type of drive called a solid state drive. And the way that a solid state drive works is that it stores data electrically inside what are called flash memory cells. And flash memory cells are simply electronic chips that are designed in such a way that they can retain information even after power has been removed to them. They are much faster than a mechanical hard drive, uh, but a solid state drive is still much slower than random access memory. These drives do eventually wear out. Uh, the chips have a finite lifetime. They can only be written to uh, a limited number of times. But for practical purposes, that number is high enough that we can still use them for day-to-day -day data storage. And as I mentioned, they are significantly faster than the mechanical hard disk uh, because they are purely electrical. There are no moving parts inside the solid state drive. Now this solid state drive I took apart is not the same as the solid state drive uh, that I took this external photo of. Uh, externally, solid state drive looks exactly like a hard drive. It's the same size box, and it has the same connectors on it. Internally, however, it's different. Now, these aren't the same drive because this is a perfectly good uh, Crucial M4 drive, which is actually a fairly modern, not the most modern, but fairly modern SSD, and I wasn't about to void the warranty on it by taking it apart. Uh, this is an older OCZ Agility drive that I had lying around, and uh, I didn't mind uh, voiding whatever warranty is left. I don't even think it's still under warranty uh, to take it apart to show you what the internal components look like. So this is not the internal components of this exact drive, uh, but this drive is going to be similar. It's just the, the exact chips are going to be a little bit different. Okay, so that's our persistent storage. We do have a couple of other types of devices that we can attach to the motherboard. So for example, uh, one type of device that if you've built your own computer before or if you've heard people talking about building their own computers before, a lot of times they make a big deal about the video card. The video card is really nothing more than a small computer, a special purpose computer that goes inside your larger computer. Uh, it has a special purpose processor on it and it usually has some dedicated random access memory on it and this special purpose processor and the special purpose device is optimized for rendering images to display on a screen. So it's optimized for doing one thing, which is to provide you with good graphics and especially moving graphics that are high resolution and are updated quickly, uh, also known as video games. Um, these cards can be separate cards. I have here a picture of the NVIDIA uh, this is actually a GeForce GTX 650Ti uh, from my own personal computer. Uh, and then this is an ATI Radeon card. I'm not sure exact model 
uh, from Wikimedia Commons here. Uh, AMD now owns ATI, and so they are behind these cards now. Uh, but these cards are what are called discrete graphics cards. They are add-in cards that plug into the motherboard. They're separate from the main processor. Modern CPUs, modern AMD and Intel CPUs, typically actually have their own video card built into them. That's called an integrated video card. And before they integrated them into the CPU, sometimes motherboards would have an integrated video card that was actually soldered onto the motherboard. So uh, modern CPUs typically will have an integrated card. The performance of that integrated card may not be uh, good enough for certain applications, particularly video editing and uh, video games. And so many gamers and some professional uh, video professionals will actually add in a separate graphics adapter or a discrete graphics card. Another add-in card that's fairly common is a network adapter. Uh, network adapters come in wired and wireless varieties and they basically enable computers to talk to each other. Uh, many times these days a wired network adapter is actually going to be integrated into the motherboard so it's actually going to be a chip soldered onto the motherboard. Uh, but there are wired network adapters that are available as cards, like this PCI card I have here. Uh, so this is a separate card that plugs into the motherboard with these connectors, and then we can plug a network cable into this card. Uh, we also have wireless adapters. Here is an Intel Centrino uh, wireless N card. This is actually a mini PCI Express card that plugs into the computer internally. So we have different types of networking adapters that we can add to the system. There are also other devices that we can attach to the system. And these devices can be either connected to the motherboard internally, so they can be plugged into a slot or other type of connector on the motherboard or even soldered to the motherboard. Uh, we also have external devices that can be attached to the system via connectors, potentially using cables. Uh, you're probably familiar with the keyboard and mouse. Those are external devices that are attached either via a USB cable or an old style PS2 or AT cable or a serial cable in the case of a really old mouse. Uh, or you might have a wireless keyboard and mouse. Those would be connected either to a special purpose wireless transmitter that plugs into the computer or via Bluetooth. Uh, which would be a type of network adapter that would either plug into the computer or be integrated inside the computer. So we have all these different types of devices that we can connect to the system, but ultimately, internally, the system contains these very specific parts. The motherboard is the component that glues them all together, and the CPU is the component that actually does all the processing, and the RAM is the fastest type of memory that we attach to the motherboard. It's not the fastest type of memory in the computer, as we'll see when we look inside the CPU itself, but it's the fastest type of external memory uh, relative to the CPU. So I hope that gives you a good overview of the internals of the computer system, uh, along with the pictures. We'll go into more detail about what each component does in later video lectures. Thank you for watching. For more information, including additional lectures, please visit my website at www.mikemurphycs.com. Due to a high volume of email, I am unable to respond to questions that are not from Coastal Carolina University students. For admissions information, please visit www.coastal.edu. This lecture is copyright 2014, Dr. Mike Murphy, and is released under Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 Unported License.